So welcome, everyone. Uh, this is day two of the revolution, and uh, we are <laughs> we have uh, with us uh, three experts. Three revolutionaries. Three revolutionaries. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I think it's. I think I'm safe in saying none born in the province of Alberta. So so these are uh, these are folks with dispassionate uh, points of view. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm the only person who was born in the province of Alberta, but I left so long ago that social credit was still in power. Uh, and I'm not kidding, they were. <laughs> um, I, I, when I came to the, the province of Saskatchewan from Ontario, uh, I learned very quickly that people in Saskatchewan don't pay much attention to Manitoba. In fact, if I had to apportion the amount of attention paid to matters political, economic, and other, as between Alberta and, and uh, Manitoba, would be about 90% or more to Alberta. And that kind of surprised me. Um, anyway, whatever the reason, and there are lots of, it turns out, lots of good reason, including many, many expatriate Saskatchewanians who are living in the province of Alberta. And so there are natural ties of various kinds, including, of course, economic ties as well, as changes in the province of Alberta, particularly on the uh, public sector employment side, have massive implications for uh, what, we, what we were for the longest time, which was a... Uh, a um, professional exporting province to the province of Alberta. So what goes on in Alberta is of real concern to those of us from Saskatchewan, and we have with us three uh, folks who have been uh, spent most of their time or much of their time in the province of Saskatchewan. Danielle Bellin, who is sitting in the center, was a faculty member at the University of Calgary for a while, and so I suppose comes with, comes with a particular perspective. Uh, John Courtney here, m many of you know John is a long term, a long time a political scientist here at the University of, uh, of Saskatchewan, but really an internationally known uh, uh, expert in electoral systems, and, uh, and, and of course a, a longtime observer of matters political, and so we're gonna hear from John first, and then uh, at the end, uh, and, and I mean at the end of the table, and at the end also of our speaking list, uh, Rose Olford is, a, uh, is an economist, uh, and only recently left or retired from the Johnson Shoyama, but is we keep her on in a host of different capacities. I hope, uh, I, and I mean that in the most positive sense. Um, and Rose is going to talk a little bit about the economic effects. I suspect uh, Rose is a regional economist and uh, and will give us an economic perspective. But we're going to start with with John. Um, so John, I'm just going to turn it over to you. And and I'm hoping that, uh, I, and we haven't checked this out, but I'm hoping everybody will speak for about 10 to 15 minutes, or certainly no more. So we have some time for questions both here and from Regina. So. John, over to you. Michael, thank you. Uh, I should point out, as we all know, that those Saskatchewan people who now reside in Alberta remain Rough Rider fans, so uh, <laughs> they still wear the green and white. Uh, let me begin. I, I've been asked by our organizer, Daniel, to speak a little bit about the history of Alberta politics, and I think that's uh, critically important to understand the context within which this election took place a couple of days ago. Alberta, Michael has pointed out that the reference point for Saskatchewan people so often is Alberta. How are things going there? Why are they doing better? Why are they not doing this? And so on. And we're all very familiar with that. And it's natural because, of course, we are adjacent provinces. Uh, we have, in many respects, shared elements of the economy uh, with the new partnership that's been developed uh, by Premier Wall and the other two premiers over the last several years. There's a sense in which our identity is increasingly westward shifting. Uh, however, there is something very peculiar about Alberta and Saskatchewan politics that I really want to delve into today. And I've prepared a very short, two slides, uh, presentation on PowerPoint, thanks to Erica, who has been a huge help to me. And I just want to run through the history of the two provinces, because it tells us a great deal about what happened two days ago. So let's take a look first at uh, Alberta. <clears throat> now, what you can see there is that there have been since 1905, only four cha changes of government, 1921, 1935, 1971, and then again two days ago. That's remarkable in itself for a period of over 100 years. 
that there's only been four different changes of government. And now we're into the, the fourth of these. But what's equally remarkable is that there are five different parties that have held office. The Liberals, the UFA, the Social Credit, the PC, and now the NDP. There has never been a repeat of any one party in office. My point is that you've got these long periods, social credit and, uh, and the PCs define longevity in politics. You've got these long periods of one party dominance. This has led one of our colleagues, uh, long since dead, at the University of Toronto, Bruff McPherson, to define Alberta as a quasi-party system. Now, what he meant by that was it was a party system monopolized by one party, not competitive two parties, but one party. Uh, given the fact that it's uh, a monopoly for one party, then it's natural that over time that one party will continue, continue to continue to win elections. And then suddenly the break comes. And when the break comes, it's usually very sharp. It's almost cataclysmic for the governing party. Uh, I'm not saying we don't have that. We haven't had that in Saskatchewan. We have, but I'm going to come to Saskatchewan in a moment and explain a key difference between the two provinces. But looking back at what you see in Alberta, the Liberals, the governing party initially, <clears throat> then ceded power in 1921 to the United Farmers of Alberta. And who were they? They were progressives. They were reformers. They were what's often called plebiscitarian, plebiscitarian Democrats. They believed in less government, more populism, lower taxes. Fast forward to 2015, who are you hearing that from? Wild Rose. And part of my argument is that Wild Rose is a kind of a natural heir to the old United Farmers of Alberta progressive line of thinking about politics. At one time, it was possible for the United Farmers of Alberta to win and win big, as they did for 14 or 15 years, because Alberta was such a rural province. Alberta is now uh, overwhelmingly an urban province, as we know three quarters of the population living in two metropolitan areas. So Wild Rose, may be the uh, intellectual uh, and political heir, if you accept my argument, to the United Farmers of Alberta, but it has the difficulty of not getting out of the rural base because that's not where the seats are now. So the big test for Wild Rose in the years to come will be to see whether they can in fact get into and manage to win some seats in the rural, in the urban areas United Farmers of Alberta uh, lost power in 1935, in part because of a sex scandal on the part of the Premier, one of the few sex scandals that I'm aware of that actually helped to bring down a government in Canada. And social credit came to office, again, kind of an intellectual heir to that old plebiscitarian uh, populist streak. And Goodness knows they held office for whatever, 36 years. They was subscribed, at least in pa on paper, and for the first few years they tried to implement some of the policies of social credit, which, as you know, were defined loosely as funny money. And the social credit, as a result, uh, they were outliers. They weren't part of the mainstream. And I think part of my argument would be that the parties that you see so far, the United Farmers and Social Credit, really had very little in the way of lasting federal counterparts. Uh, and and that's, a, that's a point that we can explore further. And then, of course, the big change came in 1971 when Peter Lougheed, an urban lawyer, and th this is important to remember because he's a bit different from the previous party leaders that, that had been around Alberta, not a farmer not from agricultural part of the province, not rural, but an urban lawyer brought his party to power. And Lougheed was many things, but I would argue that he was primarily a centrist. 
And because of that, he was able to bring in these dissident elements from various parts. And look at the size of some of his wins, 1975, all but six seats out of 75. In 1979, all but five seats. 1982, all but four seats in the legislature. So it's a one-party dominant system. But that's, as we know from our theories of political parties, that's a ripe, that's a position that's ripe for change. And the change came with, of course, uh, the scandals involving the previous government, uh, Redford, and Prentice's disastrous, in my view, campaign, and his failure to even link with the voters. Okay, that's a quick lesson on Alberta. Now let's compare Alberta to Saskatchewan. What you see there is quite remarkable, because you've got here a series of not four, but eight changes over the same period of time, I might add. And look at the pattern of those changes. Liberal, conservative, progressive coalition. This, is, this predated the Progressive Conservative Party. Liberal, followed by the CCF, followed by Liberal, and then followed by the CCF's heir, the NDP, and then the Conservatives, NDP, and then finally the SAS party. Now, what, what I want you to draw from this is one important lesson, and that is <clears throat> in Saskatchewan, because of the competitive party nature, uh, the competitive nature of the two-party system, I should say, there was always a government in waiting, and often it was the previous government kind of reshaping, reforming, rethinking its platform, maybe with a new leader. But nonetheless, it was a two-party system, unlike Alberta. So the definition that Bruff McPherson gave to Alberta of a quasi-system simply wouldn't apply here. Now, that's not to say that there were not massive sweeps. We know from the last provincial election, of course, that there was when uh, the SAS party won 49 out of 58 seats. But the same was true of the NDP uh, in 1991 under Romano, and then in 1982 under Grant Devine when the conservatives, the progressive conservatives, came to office. But those were one-offs. They were not repeated time and time and time again. So you had something particularly different about the party system here. And that's the lesson I really want to draw as I close my remarks, that uh, I want us to think about these two differences between two provinces that, on the face of it, in many respects, are quite similar. Resource base, agricultural history, all that kind of stuff. Fair enough. But I grant nothing on, on, on uh, this argument that I'm making, and that is that fundamentally you've got contrasting system between two fundamentally uh, different kinds of party systems. Now, to her credit, Rachel Notley won, but she didn't win massively. It was not like one of these big swings, uh, you know, with Lougheed and so on. So she's going to have to be on her toes. And it could very well be that now, with the Wild Rose, with a decent uh, representation in the House, may very well be able to fashion some, over three or four year time, coalition with what it needs most, and that is an urban presence and perhaps the remnant of the, cur the current Progressive Conservative Party. The lesson is obvious. This is exactly what happened in Saskatchewan. The big Romano <coughs> win was followed by a very close Romano win to the SAS party as it had been created with El Ellen Hermanson as leader. And that was in, whatever, 2000 or something. Uh, but the province was deeply split. The SAS party's roots were entirely rural. The NDP at that time had become an urban, professional party. Think of the lawyers, Romanos and the Blakeneys and so on. So you, you had this move on the part of the SAS party to try to move into the urban part. They couldn't do it by chipping away at the NDP, but they did it through re reformulation of some of their policies, making them much more palatable to the urban part of, of the province. 
And out of that came Brad Wall and, of course, the success that the Saskatchewan Party has. Uh, okay, that's enough for me. Great. Danielle. Thank you very much. Um, I will start with a Ralph Klein quote because, you know, Ralph Klein, as you know, was, was premier of, of Alberta for many years, uh, for most of the 1990s and uh, up to 2006. And uh, I'm not sure if it's an authentic quote or not, but even if it's a urban legend, it's very telling. So the quote is, what's great about Alberta is that you can speak like a redneck and spend like a socialist. But of course, that is only true when oil prices are high, okay? Um, and of course, um, an important aspect of this story uh, and the story of this election is oil prices are not that high. They decline quite a bit, although now they are increasing again. Um, and that's very important, not just to understand the context of the election, but even what will happen over the next few years for the Notley government. Because Notley is talking about you know, diverse, a, a, a more diverse economy for Alberta, but as she, she acknowledges yesterday uh, in her press conference, and, uh, it, they still rely heavily on oil, and if oil prices increase, uh, she will have more money to spend, <laughs> perhaps like a socialist, and also uh, perhaps also more resources to actually diversify the economy and invest in other sectors. So ironically, if you want to diversify an economy, uh, um, uh, having uh, higher oil prices might be a good thing, at least in the short run. But, and I'm sure that uh, Rose Alford will have a lot of things to say about this later, but if we want to con understand the electoral context and understand why the, the PC lost the election so badly, certainly the economic downturn, lower oil prices, a difficult, challenging fiscal situation, which actually is not new, uh, because, uh, uh, you know, uh, even before the fall in the oil prices, there were some significant challenges. Alberta, as we know, is a boom and bust economy. And uh, people over the years have witnessed very deep cuts in education spending, for example. Uh, um, and and they, they are used to this, but at the same time, no one really likes this. Uh, um, and, and so there was a lot of grumbling about the recent budget that was stable not long before uh, the election was announced. It's an early election. We have to keep that in mind. There was absolutely no obligation for, for Prentice to go to the polls. He could have waited another year. It was, the election was set a year later. So he decided to have an anticipated election because, and the only, real, the only reason why he wanted to do this, it's not because the economy was doing well. It wasn't. It's not because uh, the fiscal situation was great, because it wasn't. It's because Wild Rose was on its knees. Because in December, Daniel Smith and eight other MLAs, they just crossed the floor of the Lich Fletcher. And so he thought, hey, that's my threat. The threat is Wild Rose. They are on their knees. They don't have a leader. Let's go and have a campaign. Of course, uh, that was a, a kind of, uh, I think, a simplistic understanding of the switch, and he made, of course, a huge uh, miscalculus. If he had waited another year, we don't know what the result will have been. We don't know, you know what will have been in, in terms of the, the fiscal switch. Uh, oil prices could rebound. We are already increasing. We don't know. Okay, so he took a risk. But he thought it was a calculated risk because the main opposition party was Wild Rose. And of course, it maybe it's a cognitive bias here, he didn't think about the NDP at all. I'm sure in, in thinking about this situation, the NDP was, uh, uh, they had only four MLAs before this election. They were uh, the fourth party in the Lich Fletcher. They were below not only the, uh, the, the PC and Wild Rose, but also the Liberal Party. So uh, he didn't see it coming. The campaign began, and what was the turning point of the campaign, as it happens from time to time, was the televised debate, the leader's debate. Uh, in some, as we know, and John Courtney could tell you that, during some campaigns, both federal and provincial level, these debates don't matter that much. But in that case, it mattered. Why? A lot of people were looking for change. The PC had moved a bit back to the right with Jim Prentice compared to the Redford years. Redford had found a way in 2012 to get a lot of more progressive voters or centrist voters on board against Wild Rose. The threat was Wild Rose. So come on board with the PC. We'll fight these you know, uh, people on the far right. 
what happened with Prentiss is that he, in a way, uh, um, really adopted a pro-business stance uh, um, and he alienated some of the more progressive voters, for example, with some of the, uh, uh, the, the fiscal policy. Uh, um, and then, during this televised debate, Notley, the leader of the NDP, who was not that well known by most people in Alberta, emerged as a credible voice for change. Okay? And she did a great performance and she ran a very good campaign. When people are frustrated with the economic situation, when they are frustrated with the fiscal situation, when a party has been in power for so long, some people, they look for a vehicle for change that's realistic and that looks moderate enough that they could uh, step in. Of course, there is an NDP, an old NDP base in Alberta, especially in Edmonton. So the NDP had some MLAs. They didn't come from nowhere, but they were able to gather support from people who normally would not vote NDP. Perhaps they will vote for the Liberals. And last time, many of them voted for Redford. Okay? But uh, if you look at the context uh, uh, of the election, it's quite clear that uh, um, Notley emerged as a relatively moderate figure who could really be this vehicle uh, for change. And I think we have to give her some credits. You know, Prentice did some really big mistakes, and he did mistakes during the campaign as well, gaffes, like when he told Notley during the debate that basically math was difficult, although he had misspoke and, and made a, a, a foolish statement saying that she will increase the corporate tax to 20%, which she had, why the actual number is 12%. So uh, uh, there he didn't look very good. And also, of course, when he told people uh, uh, to look in the mirror, people in Alberta should look in the mirror. But when you look in the mirror in Alberta, you should see the, the PC, these two letters in, in bold, because they have been in power for more than 40 years, so they are on the other side of the mirror. And that's the way uh, a lot of Albertans understood this, right? Um, in French, we have this expression, usure du pouvoir. You know that uh, after, a while, after a while, power erodes and it's fatigue of power. Huh? That would be a good translation. And <laughs> the peace in Alberta has faced that for a long time. Stelnak, who replaced Klein, didn't have, the, he didn't have the, the, this kind of populist mojo, or he was not as popular as Klein. And there's a very good article published before the election by David Stewart and Anthony Sayers, uh, in the Winnipeg Free Press about the fact that uh, uh, under, uh, especially under Prentice, but before that under Stelmac, in a way, uh, the PC lost its kind of populist appeal. And when you look at Prentice, even towards the end when he was saying to people, don't vote for the NP, it's too dangerous for business, he really sounded like someone who was an advocate of Calgary-based firms of the business sector, and he didn't have the kind of populist appeal of Klein, who was also very pro-business, but he had this kind of folksy uh, touch. He made also some mistakes, but people will actually forgive him. He said a lot of silly things. But Prentice, not so much. Um, now, what are the implications of this election? I don't know how much time I have left, but for uh, uh, both <laughs> Saskatchewan and for, uh, uh, for Saskatchewan and for the rest of the country. Well, before I say that, I, I have to say that a lot of this will depend on what Notley does during the first six months of her uh, uh, government, because uh, the federal election won't happen before October. Um, people will be looking very carefully at what's happening in, in Alberta. And if, sh if the transition is successful, because now it's the first transition since 1971. It's incredible. So they have to manage the transition with the civil service, huh? which is very important. We don't think about that. The media don't talk about that a lot, but it's very, very important. It's absolutely crucial. And we are a school of public policy, but also public administration. And we, of course, know that in our students, brilliant students who are here know that as well. Um, uh, but also, it will be the way it's about framing. It's about how she will frame herself. You can already see she's reaching out to the business sector. And she has to tread very carefully because, as uh, uh, John Courtney said, she only got 40, 41 percent of the vote. So still a majority of people voted on the right. Uh, if you take the votes of the PC and the Wild Party together, it's more than what the NDP got. So she has to adopt a kind of more center-left approach. Of course, she has to satisfy her base as well, but she will have to be careful. Now, the implication for Saskatchewan, some people, some MLAs here came out yesterday and said, this is great. Uh, you know, this is, we, we, it's really enthusiastic. I mean, we are enthusiastic about this, and it shows that, you know, it's, it's basically, it, it might uh, trigger a wave in Saskatchewan and so forth. I will not be so optimistic right now just because Bradwell remains one of the most 
popular premiers in the country, if not the most popular. He's still way ahead in the polls. And there was this article in, I think it was in the National Post, I saw uh, they had the 10 provinces with the polls over the last two or three years. And the only province that was really, really stable and when the premier, the, the, premier the, the party in power was way ahead, the opposition was Saskatchewan. That was a, the, the, the line, the green line above was almost stable and very high in terms of the, the way people are, uh, in terms of popular support and satisfaction towards the premier. So I think uh, um, there is still, it's a very, it's an uphill battle for the NDP in Saskatchewan. I'm not sure this, what happened, doesn't have any consequence here, especially if the Notley government is perceived as successful. But there is a cautionary tale. We know what happened, for example, with uh, Bob Ray in Ontario in the second half of the 1980s. And uh, there was a very good piece by Gerald Kaplan, uh, uh, published in 2010, that someone I think shared, uh, uh, that I saw on Facebook uh, this morning, and I thought it was a very useful uh, piece, where he, 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 he tells the story of how business, big business in Ontario, uh, um, came really uh, after Bob Ray. And, and that really uh, derailed uh, his government, his NDP government. Especially Lord Black, Coral Black, played a major role. And he said, I won't invest in Ontario anymore until the NDP is gone for pow from power and so forth. Now, the messages I hear from the business communities and the oil industry in Alberta right now are mixed. Okay? And so if they adopt a pragmatic stance and decide to work with the NDP and they send a message that they are fine with it, and it seems that it's the message, dominant message I hear now, that, that should be fine. But if the Ontario scenario repeats and then there is a, a frontal attack from the media uh, uh, and, and uh, the business, the business uh, leaders against the NDP, then, then it will be a, a, a difficult, uh, will be a difficult struggle. So that's important. If we look at the federal scene, the, the biggest winner, of course, in Ottawa of this is, is Thomas Mulcair because he can say, see, if it's possible in Alberta, the seemingly the most conservative province in Canada, then it's possible for Canada as well. You know, if they try in Alberta, why should not we try uh, from coast to coast to coast? Okay, and that's what he said yesterday, right? Um, now, uh, we would have to see again uh, what's happened, uh, what's ha what will happen in Alberta over the next few months and, and, and you know, what will happen with Nutley. We remember Redford was very popular. She won the campaign. She did a great campaign and then started, things started to, you know, fall apart really rapidly and, 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 and her popularity fell rapidly as well. Now, I don't expect this, uh, that this will happen uh, with Notley, but you never know. And again, it will depend a lot on oil prices and factors she doesn't control. Okay? Uh, but if coming in October, uh, um, the, the Notley government is perceived as relatively successful, or at least that they can handle things relatively well, this plays well uh, for Thomas Mulcair and perhaps even for Justin Trudeau because they are perceived as agents of change and they can say if Alberta was ready for change, if Alberta can uh, move to the left, so can Canada as a whole. So the, the biggest loser at the federal level, of course, of this election is, is Stephen Harper uh, uh, because it is you know, uh, Chateau Fort, as we say in French, it's his uh, kingdom, people perceive this is Harper land. And it, at the federal level, it's still the case. So it doesn't mean that, uh, as many pundits have said, it's not because uh, the, the NDP won, uh, uh, you know, the provincial election that they will win all the seats or most of the seats at the federal election. These are two different arenas. But certainly, it sends a strong warning to Harper that he cannot take his own province for granted. Thank you. <laughs> I shouldn't have agreed to be last here. I knew that. You would be um, great. Just down to earth, though. I will. That's my job. Um, I would point to two main reasons for the dramatic win of the NDP in Alberta. The first is the longer-term demographic trend, including urbanization, and the second is the fall in the price of oil in, in, in the fall of 2014 and its consequences for the Alberta economy and the provincial government budget. So first on the demographic changes. The Alberta that people of my generation remember and the Alberta that backed the 44 years of the PC government no longer exists, and here are the reasons. Alberta has experienced extremely fast population growth due to in-migration. Between 2001 and 2011, Alberta's population grew by 23 percent, 
and that followed a previous decade of that population growing by 17%. To put that in perspective, in Saskatchewan, we feel like we've enjoyed really stellar growth in the, in, in the recent past. Between 2001 and 2011, Saskatchewan's population grew by 5.5%. And that followed a decade where it had declined by 1%. So by all measures, Alberta's provincial population has grown extremely fast. Alberta is also Saskatchewan's most urban province. Uh, John already alluded to this. 83% of Alberta's population lives in places that Statistics Canada calls urban places. 83%. The comparable number for Saskatchewan is 67%. And if you take the metro areas of Calgary and Edmonton combined, it accounts for almost three quarters of Alberta's population. Alberta is Canada's youngest province with the lowest median age. It also has the highest percentage of provinces of population in the 15 to 64 year old age group. I'm coming to resent that cutoff. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, that's the labor force. That's the working force. It has 71% of its population in that age cohort. And uh, Saskatchewan's equivalent is 66%. And it also has Canada's highest labor force participation rate. So those 15 to 64 year olds have an extremely high labor force participation rate. Men and women has the highest female labor force participation rate in Canada. So they're not only in that age group, they're in the labor force. Alberta is also an increasingly diverse province. One indicator of this is the percentage of the population that is foreign born. In Canada's cities, not surprisingly, the city with the highest percentage foreign born is Toronto at about 50% of the people there were not born in Canada, followed by Vancouver at 40% and Calgary is third at 26%. More than a quarter of the population in Calgary was not born in Canada. So that tells us both that the in-migration that has supported that very rapid population increase didn't just come from other provinces, it also came from the rest of the world. I think these demographic changes are fundamentally important to understanding the desire for change in Alberta. There's no reason to assume that this new, young, diverse, urban population <coughs> would vote the way its predecessors did. It appears they have different preferences and expectations for government. Uh, and while this pattern has been developing for some time, it seems that we reached a tipping point sometime before Tuesday. <coughs> and it would be interesting actually to see from John's slide what the, what the nature of the tipping points were at those other major junctures. The second reason I want to point to, and perhaps the most important, is the way the Alberta government and others have not been able to come to grips with the boom and bust oil dependent economy. Now the nature of the boom and bust economy is beyond the control of the provincial governments. There are and should be some attempts to diversify away from the natural resource dependence. Notley said that in her acceptance speech. I've heard that at least 40 for 40 years in Saskatchewan. Uh, and there, there can be small marginal changes and those should be pursued, absolutely. But they cannot control the price of oil. And with oil being an important part and a valuable economic base for the provincial economy in Alberta and Saskatchewan, uh, this means that the provincial economy is vulnerable to the perpetual boom and bust of oil prices. But this does not have to translate into the same boom and bust in government budgets. A government can do something about the vulnerability of its revenues to the oil price. In the case of Alberta, when 21% of government revenues comes from oil revenues, and then you have the price of oil cut in half, you have a $7 billion revenue shortfall. Then you have to introduce a very unattractive budget and within six months, the people of Alberta go from being the fastest growth, highest per capita income, the engine of growth for the Canadian economy, according to the Prime Minister, to suddenly hearing that they have, will have to pay user fees for health care, 
seeing public sector job losses in addition to the 50,000 private sector job losses they've already had, um, uh, other public sector cuts, higher taxes. The population might then rightly ask, and perhaps they did, what did you do with all the revenue that was rolling in during the good times? Mm -hmm. That would have been my thought. I mean, it was my thought, it still is my thought. And the government had to know the bust was coming. It always happens. It happened before, 1980 to 1986, during the 90s, 2008, 2009. Now, this is a bit of a digression, but I, I need to do this. There are at least three problems that arise from provincial revenues being so closely tied to the price of oil. These are not, these are not mine. These have been... Uh, firmly established by, by others who have studied this. One is, this is the, this is the uh, spending like a socialist uh, problem. It's also been referred to as spending like a drunken sailor. But <laughs> revenues originating from oil royalties are a windfall for the government and seem to result in higher spending than would be the case if you had to extract that, that money from the taxpayers by looking them in the eye and telling them you have a higher tax rate. What happens then is the, the spending is not sustainable. We have a higher per capita spending, government spending in Alberta than mm -hmm. any other mm -hmm. province than, than, uh, except Newfoundland. And that's the same, pro the same reason, the same problem. That budget is yet to come. Mm -hmm. And it's also been empirically studied. If you look for all the reasons why the spending might be higher, you still find that the spending is higher than it should be when there are these windfall gains. Second, using oil revenues for operating costs means that you fail to develop a sustainable base made up of less volatile sources like income taxes and sales taxes. And this is, this is why that look in the mirror comment has some truth to it. As long as Alberta is going to refuse to have sales taxes and doesn't want a progressive income tax, then you're going to rely on oil royalties. And if they rely on oil royalties, you're going to ride this, this cycle. Oil revenues change with the business cycle, making government budgets pro-cyclical rather than counter-cyclical as they should be. Instead of uh, helping to cushion or mitigate the business cycle, governments instead aggravate or contribute to the business cycle when they tie their revenue and budget so closely to that oil price. Third, uh, reason why this is a problem of oil revenues and provincial government uh, dependence is the absence of the required discipline to save in the good years for the inevitable bad years that will follow. Peter Lougheed started the Heritage Fund partly to this end. And this would be one way to set aside surpluses in the good years. But of course, before you can set aside surpluses in the good years, you have to have surpluses in the good years, not spend it all. Set aside surpluses in the good years to be used in the bad years. This is not new. Some of you will recognize this as the biblical advice that Joseph gave to the Pharaoh. It's been known for a while. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems simply not possible for governments in Canada to do this. So the boom-bust economy becomes a magnified boom-bust government budget. And the people were not amused, it would appear. All right, Thanks. well, let's have a hand for our three panelists.